This is the Jail Ministry Podcast. The J-A-I-L, or Jesus Acts and Inmates Lives Ministry, is Christ-centered and provides programs focused on the prevention and intervention for the incarcerated. Jail Ministry also provides support to offenders, criminal justice professionals, victims, and their families. Thank you for your continued financial assistance. For more information, visit jailmen.org. Now, here's today's lesson. Hi, my name is Kevin McCarthy. Welcome to Jail Bible Study. And I'm so excited to have you guys. I appreciate you taking the time to watch us and take uh, notes here and there. And I encourage you to also uh, record some of these verses and go back and study them uh, tomorrow and the day after. I, I find the lesson I'm doing right now, I've been through this probably a hundred times or so, and I learned a lot of new facts today. So we're gonna study today John chapter 3, probably one of my favorite, favorite passages, is because it's a wonderful story about Jesus meeting someone who is probably the most intelligent scholar, Jewish scholar in all of Israel. And we're going to see what happens with him meeting him. And there's a couple of questions I'm going to have for you right now, kind of get you thinking a little bit, because in this passage, the message is, Truly, truly, you must be born again to see the kingdom of heaven. So I'll ask you right now, um, do you know when you're going, where you're going when you die? Do you, are you for sure about that? Remember, there are two things in this life that we can't control completely out of our hands. It's in God's control. First thing is when we are born from our parents. That's a miracle in itself. And the second one is when or how are we going to be born again of the Spirit? And that is not everyone. Not everyone comes to Him, to, to God. So let's get into Scripture here. And I really want to do is kind of paint a picture for you, kind of like watching a movie. And my wife and I are watching uh, a series of movies right now on the Old Testament. And we're learning about Abraham and Moses. And sometimes we stop halfway and start up again. So we kind of have to go back a little bit and go over a few things so we know where we are in the story. So this is chapter 3 in John. John, as we know, was the closest to Jesus. He was the only apostle that did not die on a cross or a, a vicious, wicked death. He was also asked by Jesus to look after his mother. So John writes very intimately. And so... Jesus comes in. Now, this would be 2,023 years ago. He's born 2,023 years ago, more or less. At this time, he's about 30 years old. So he's going to have a three-year ministry before he goes to the cross and dies for our sins. So what I really picked up today is looking at chapter 2 for just a few minutes and what happened before Nicodemus came to Jesus, okay? So if we look at chapter 2, and we go to verse 15, Jesus was shocked, he was angry that the Jewish people and the Jewish leaders would turn the temple into a flea market. So there were pots and pans being sold there, all kinds of jewelry, animals, chickens, and it looked like a barn and a, and a garage sale put together. And it was absolute contempt and disrespect for the temple that God had ordained. So Jesus goes in there, verse uh, chapter 2, verse 13, he says, He made a scourge, which is like a whip, of cords. He drove all the animals out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen, and he poured over the coins of the money changers. Okay, the money changers were pretty, pretty, they were kind of evil in their own right. They would change money, but they would also keep a profit. So they were doing their money changing, scamming right then and there in the, in the temple, Jesus would flip it over, flipped over the tables, made a complete riot. I think in today's world, if he had done this, he would be, he'd be labeled a terrorist, urban terrorist. But now keep in mind, the Jewish people had ruled and had settled this area for hundreds and hundreds of years. And about 100 years prior, the Roman Empire would push east and take over Israel. Okay, so the the Romans were in charge of this area, in charge of Jerusalem, and they had pretty strict laws, 
pretty strict things that you had to do to follow their leader and you had to pay taxes without much choice in, in the matter so it was kind of a dictatorship and they weren't happy with that they wanted the leader to come in to take over the roman army well the romans would use a religious group called the pharisees okay the pharisees were a religious order of jewishness that had hundreds of rules they took the ten commandments and then they added to the Ten Commandments. So they had rules about washing your hands three times before eating. They had all kinds of rules of what you had to do if you handled a sheep or handled any cattle. Um, they had rules that you could not um, heal and not call a doctor on the Sabbath day Saturday, unless it was life-threatening. So they were very proud. They were very arrogant. They thought they knew everything. And they were also proud of their birthright or their ancestors so they always had like their family tree and it would go back through all the relig religious leaders and probably connecting with abraham the founder so very proud very self-righteous uh kind of walk around with their nose up in the air okay so the jews were the romans kind of used the jews to enforce order to enforce taxes to kind of keep them down so that they would not be uh in rebellion against the Roman authority. So Jesus says again, he says, take these things away. Stop making my father's house a place of business. So they're using the temple, the temple that was built under Solomon, which was a majestic temple, and they were using it to make money. Kind of running scams there. So the last two verses we'll hit before we get to chapter three. So Jesus, but he says, now, when, he, when Jesus was in Jerusalem at the Passover, during the feast, many believed in his name, observing his signs, which he was doing. So he was, he was already doing miracles. He was healing the sick, bringing the blind back to sight. People who were dying, he brought back to life. All kinds of miracles. Not all of them are in the book of John. If, they're, if it said that if we listed all of his miracles, the books would go on and on and on. So, but Jesus on his part was not entrusting himself to the Jews, for he knew, he says, for he knew all men. So he's not going to put his trust and faith in these people yet because he doesn't know if they're just kind of following him for the good things, the healings, or do they see him as the son of God? Last thing in verse 25, and because he did not need anyone to testify concerning man for he himself knew what was in man for jesus knew as the son of god he knew that a sinful dark heart was in man all men have sinned and fall short of the glory of god so he knew the reason he came remember the reason he came is to seek and to save the lost and all of these people were lost all these people were lost in sin to one degree or another so what's interesting is this scholar named Nicodemus, to go to John chapter 3, 1. As I said before, Nicodemus was the all-star of Pharisees, okay? He was probably the highest ranked person in Israel with respect to what he knew and how he commanded himself and how he ruled the people. He's kind of like governor, governor of a state. He had that much control and also religious control too. So he was seen as someone very close to God. But a question for all of us, how, do, are we sure that when we die, we're going to heaven? What will happen? That's the biggest question for everybody. Well, Nicodemus, he has that question in his heart and his mind. He's not sure. So he's going to go to see Jesus in the dark of night. Why would that happen, folks? Why would he do that? He didn't want anyone to see him. He did not want to be seen with this terrorist that already tore up the temple, turned over all the tables. He was already, Jesus was already public enemy number one. From here on in, they're gonna try and take him out. They want him murdered. They don't want him, or in jail. They want to get rid of Jesus because he 
is threatening what they teach, what they believed in, all of these works you had to do. Oh, the works went on and on and on. You never knew if you were good enough. And that'd be an awful feeling. You didn't know if you did enough things. But Jesus came to say, it's faith in me alone that we are saved, that we're born again. So let's start out in chapter John, chapter 3, 1. We're going to read about the um, first 12 verses or so. I'm not sure if we can get through with the entire reading um, in one session. So we're going to kind of really dig into what it means to be born again. Okay, what does that mean? So chapter 3, now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. So he's coming into Jesus, see Jesus at night. I'm sure Jesus didn't live in a real fancy place, but he came at night. And this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi or teacher, we know that you've come from God as a teacher. Oh, a lot of people today, they'll say, oh, he's not the son of God, but he's a great man. He's a very moral person. And he's a good teacher if we listen to some of what he, what he commands. So, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is, is with him. No one can do those things. So, he's still, he's on the fence right now. Okay, Jesus is a good person. He's done these wonderful things. I've heard about him. I'm curious, what's going on? How do you do these things? Well, Jesus, he knows his heart. He knows Nicodemus. He knows his mind. He knows all about him. Just like Jesus knows all about you, every one of us, he knows our hearts. Jesus answered him, he says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Wow. Right off the bat with Nicodemus, he lays it right down there. That's how Jesus is. Doesn't waste a lot of happy talk. He goes right to the point. So folks, Nicodemus in verse 4 says, how can a man be born again when he's old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? There's a dialogue going on right now. There's a, there's a talk conversation. He says it twice. When Jesus says truly, truly, twice from the word of God, it is the truth. It is the absolute truth. He says truly, truly, I say to you, Unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. We'll come back to that. Verse 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the Spirit is Spirit. So he's, Nicodemus is probably, I'm not sure what he's talking about here. Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. You must be. He said it three times, born again. Then he says probably my favorite verse in John because it reminds me the first time I heard it and it also reminds me of living in Texas or Oklahoma or any of the plain states that get the big windstorms, tornadoes. We had one last week. Wind shifted around from the south to the north in about 45 minutes. Wow. A little bit of drizzle and a hard rain into hail. Possible tornadoes. All within an hour. So where Jesus says in verse 8, The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it. But you do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So, so is everyone born of the Spirit. We'll come back to that. I'm going to touch on a couple of these verses here earlier because there's so much here. Um... Our Bible say you must be born again. So born again means not just kind of your old self being shined up, put on some new clothes, maybe get new haircut, hairdo for your women there, put some makeup on, do the nails. No, no, no. This is a complete, complete change from the inside. I don't think anyone can, can really fully comprehend this. And in my studies the last few days, most of all the pastors said that this is the biggest and greatest miracle of creation in the whole world. They're putting it right up with the world being created from nothing, that we are being recreated 
as Christians. So you can say born again, or you can say regeneration, to completely renew and make something new. But think about it. You can take the worst sinner and take the person like Paul in the Bible. Paul persecuted the Christians. He had some of them stoned to death. He was going to, to find and identify and kill more Christians when he was born again by the light, by the light, by the light of Christ and the Holy Spirit. Turned him into a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. And that's what Paul said. But for all of us, we're a new creation. So if you think about that, you see someone, I remember seeing someone back in college, and I thought, you know, he'd like to get together and party with us, have a few beers, have fun and stuff. And then all of a sudden, Dave found religion. We were kind of mocking him, or, and, and Dave didn't come to the parties anymore. He didn't, he didn't want to get involved and do these kind of things. He was, he was back doing Bible reading, study for school, just kind of living like a whole different life. So that's how it is with us. We're, we're, we're completely recreated, okay? And if we think about this, Nicodemus, he was, he was the top of the tops. So he had a spiritual pride. So when Jesus says to him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he says to him, you cannot see the kingdom of God. So Nicodemus, he thought by his family, family lineage, by what he'd done, his role, his, his level of, of achievements, he thought he was good to go. And so Nicodemus says, how can a man be born when he's old? So he's kind of confounded here. He says, he, he, how can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Can he? How can that happen? Well, well, wait a second. Jesus says unto you, truly, truly, I say to you, so he's commanding this. There's no kind of discussion back and forth. It, it's, it's a command. It's not, not arguing with him. He says, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So what that means, the Holy Spirit, when God sends the Holy Spirit into someone, someone that's been exposed, reading God's word, the Bible, heard a sermon, been with someone that quotes scripture, someone that is, is confounded by a sin, we're washed. The Holy Spirit, it takes that filth, that filth out of our minds, out of our hearts. It, it washes it. It gives, you, it gives you a knowledge, a deeper knowledge of your sin. And you recognize, I've lived like that for 35 years. How, how could I think those thoughts? How could I look at those movies or look at those pornography on my phone, whatever? How could I do that? It's absolutely awful. So the Holy Spirit will wash washes your heart, washes your mind. It gives you a whole new affect, everything. It's completely different. So Nicodemus, he's, 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 he's asking about this new spirit within you. So Nicodemus says, he says, I'm going to read this, this paragraph here real quick here. Um, how could a Jewish scholar be completely confused by Jesus' demands? How could, he be, how could that happen? So God promised today when his people be born again. And also, Ezekiel, we'll talk about this, what born again means. We're going to flip to Ezekiel in the Old Testament because Nicodemus, he knew the Old Testament. And these scholars, they knew everything. They, they had to memorize the first five books of the Bible. But now this is written in the Old Testament. The Holy Spirit was not very active in the Old Testament in changing people's hearts and bringing them to Christ. For God had a plan, and his plan was to bring Jesus approximately 4,000 years after creation. There was a terrible, terrible world then, very evil, very brutal. But I'll read this to you because it's one of my favorite three verses in the Bible. It's so descriptive, and yet it's coming from Ezekiel who's a prophet. A prophet is someone that God reveals himself to. Okay? 
I'll read it all in one shot here. For I will take from you the nations. I'll gather you from all the lands and bring you into your own land. Verse 25. So I'm in chapter 36, verse 25. He says, Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. There's the washing that Jesus, the Son of God, was talking about. The washing of our hearts. He says, Moreover, I'll give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. And I will remove your heart of stone from your flesh and give you a new heart of flesh. I know when I was not a believer, not a Christian, not born again, not regenerated, I had a hard heart. I would mock other people, didn't care about other people, kind of always thinking about myself. In fact, I really didn't like God at all. I, I kind of, once in a while I would say, oh, thank God for this, thank God for that. But I didn't really respect and honor him. I didn't. My heart was hardened. It was not a soft heart of flesh. It was a hard heart. And that's what happens to people. The older they get, the more they sin, the more they turn to depravity, the more they turn to evil. I don't care what the sinning is, what the terrible things are, but it's their hearts become hardened. They become very hard, hard to be around. Family members will have problems. They'll say, oh, he's just kind of old and crusty. He's got a hard heart. So, Ezekiel says, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will be careful to, to observe my laws. He gives us new laws. He gives us a new heart. He washes us. Takes all that filthiness off us. He gives us a, a new spirit. A spirit of Christ, a spirit that longs for more of Christ, longs to read God's Word. And the amazing thing is, when we are born again, people will say, oh, he's acting different. I'm not sure I want to be around him that much. He's too uh, holy. But when you're with other Christians, that's when you just love to be with other Christians, when you're born again. So he's saying also, Real important here. Our salvation is not in our family tree, our family line. I've heard people say, oh gosh, we were born, we were raised in the church. That's one. We're raised in the church. My father was an usher. You know, he did some Bible studies. And I went to Sunday school for a few years. We got kind of busy, got into sports and stuff. But, you know, yeah, I think I'm, I think I'm, I think I'm a Christian because that's how we live. That's how we, that's how we grew up. Or other people will say, well, I married a, a, a Christian and she will read Bible verses sometimes. But, you know, I, I don't really, I don't feel the need to really go to church all that much. But I think I'm a pretty good person. So that's what he's talking about. Being born in through your family or by works. No, it's by the Spirit. Okay, you must be born again. Now back to verse 8. The wind blows where it wishes. Three things are right there. Okay. The wind blows as it wishes. We can't control the wind blowing from the south to the north in 20 minutes. We can't do that, can we? We can't, we can't change or, or predict or know how, where the rain's going to fall. Okay, where that tornado is going to come, the hailstorm that just missed our house last week by about three or four miles. We can't predict those things. And that's what Jesus is saying right now. See, he's using these comparisons and these analogies. He's keeping it simple. Everybody's been out in a windstorm before. Everyone knows what it's like to have to put on a jacket because all of a sudden, oh man, it's getting cold out there, and I've got some chores to do. So we know that that wind blows, and we can't control it. Well, so it is with the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. See, God sends that Holy Spirit, and you must be born again. And it happens in an instant. It happens 
just like that. And it turns our heart. So being born again precedes us putting our faith in Christ, Jesus Christ. It precedes that. Sometimes we, we can't even see it. It just happens so quick. Well, all of a sudden, you want to read the, your Bible. Or all of a sudden, you feel this complete dread for your sins, and you want to repent. So that being born again happens in an instant, in a flash. A lot of times, we don't even recognize it. So the wind is the Holy Spirit. And when the wind, when the Holy Spirit came in the book of Acts, it came as a wind blowing through a really noticeable sound, high sounding wind. So the wind is three things about that wind. It's the sovereign will of God. Sovereign will of God. Now, what that means is we can't control it. It's by God. It's by God using Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit to give us that washing, the new heart the new mind. I know everyone wants to be go to heaven, and, and or not everyone, but people will say, oh, you know what? I just put my faith in them, my, my hope in them. Eh, not, that's not, that's not usually. Usually it comes through an encounter, going to a Bible study, or maybe you have some tough times and you turn to the Bible, you're, you're just kind of broken. Or some people, they have it quite easy. A lot of families that are born, literally really born solid Christians, praying with their kids, Bible study every night. Those kids and those families are truly blessed. They're so blessed because they grew up in Christianity and we, we, we can tell those younger children, 10, 12, 13 years old, you can see they love the Bible. They're sweet kids. So it's still a work of God working with the Holy Spirit. Second thing is, it's invisible. It's invisible, but we can feel it. We can feel it. Everyone will say, you know, I remember right around that time, last two years ago, something different happened. I, 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 I didn't want to hang around with the people I used to hang out with. I don't want to use those words, those cuss words. So. Yeah, people say we, we, we hear it, we, we, we hear the wind, we don't, we, but we, don't know, we know not where it comes from. And that's where God works. Third thing is, it's mysterious. No one can plan or attain it. No one can. No one can attain it. And so I think what we'll do, we've got a few minutes left. I'm going to finish with a great Bible verse. But we will pick up next week because we want to see the rest of the story. And we'll also cover one of Jesus' favorite verses in the Bible and also mine, John 3.16. So I don't want to rush right now. It's, it's talking about salvation, it, it's just a wonderful, wonderful miracle. It's so great that we don't want to kind of rush through it. But John will write again in 1 John, okay? He's going to write in 1 John. He's an older man now, gone through a lot of suffering. And he's going to write in 1 John, 1 John 5, 18. 1 John 5, 18, okay? Great verse here. This verse, it's a good verse to finish on. I think this gives me a lot of hope, okay? 1 John chapter 5, 18, verse 18. He says, we know that no one who is born of God sins, but he who is born of God keeps him, and the evil one does not touch him. What's that mean here? We know that no one who is born of God relishes or delights in sin, but he who is born of God keeps him. So being born again keeps us, even though we may sin. We can't lose our salvation. God will keep him. Okay? And that's a great, great promise for all of us, that he will keep us, and he will not allow. Look at this. And the evil one does not touch him. Now, that's a great promise. He will keep him, and he will not allow Satan, the devil, to touch him. He will not allow him to be possessed or taken over. He is in God. 
once we're saved, we're in God, we may, we may fall, we may wander, but we can't lose our salvation. We are not touched by the evil one. So folks, think about this. Think about what we've learned today. Think about it. Are you born again? What are the changes you would see? And do you have a love for Jesus, a real deep love of Jesus? And do you like to come to him in prayer and read your Bibles? Those are my answers, and thanks for watching today. Amen.